For the last part of my lecture series, I want to talk about um, examples of natural selection in humans. And the two particular examples that I'm going to be talking about are the evolution of lactose tolerance in East Africa and of pygmy short stature. So, if we're going to be talking about natural selection, we have to first, of course, acknowledge Charles Darwin, um, who came up with the theory of uh, natural selection. In fact, to quote from Darwin, he said, this preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection. Variations neither useful nor injurious would not be affected by natural selection and would be left a fluctuating element, as perhaps we see in the species called polymorphic. And that was from his classic book on the origin of species, published in 1859. And you might recognize from our first lecture that this is really talking about genetic drift, random fluctuations. However, part of the evolutionary change that we see is not just going to be due to random genetic drift, it's also going to be doing, due to natural selection. And so according to that theory, um, natural variation exists and is heritable. More organisms are born than can survive, and therefore organisms best suited to the environment survive more often, and slight differences can accumulate in a species over time. So this is the idea of gradual evolution of a species by natural selection. And this is Huxley, who was also known as Darwin's bulldog, because he was the big proponent of his theory. And he said, how extremely stupid not to have thought of that. So when Darwin first came up with this theory of natural selection, there was really no concept of genetics as we know it today. In fact, it wasn't until the late 1800s that Mendel proposed his theory of genetics. Um, so in the 1930s and 40s, there was sort of a synthesis of natural selection um, and genetics and mathematics population genetics. And at that time, it was proposed that genetic variation in populations arises by chance through mutation and recombination, that evolution consists primarily of changes in the frequencies of alleles between one generation and another, largely as a result of genetic drift, gene flow, and natural selection, and that speciation occurs gradually when populations are reproductively isolated, for example, by geographic barriers. And so if we look at this timeline, starting with the origin of species, and then Mendelian inheritance is actually rediscovered in 1900. It was first proposed in the late 1880s, but very few people knew about it at that time. And then in the early 1900s, we have the theoretical foundations of population genetics. And then, as I mentioned, the modern synthesis in the 30s. And then in the 70s, we have um, Kimura's theory of neutral evolution which was proposing that most changes in speciation events are simply due to random genetic drift and to new mutation events. And I think that today we would say it's a combination of all of the above. Um, there's certainly a lot of genetic drift that occurs, but we know that natural selection is having a very important uh, influence on the variation that we see in terms of phenotypic variation and even disease susceptibility. So let's look what happens when a neutral mutation occurs in a population, as indicated by this individual in green. Let's look what happens as we proceed forward in generations. And you can see there's not too many changes in allele frequency. But what happens when we have a beneficial mutation, which means that it increases the fitness of the individual, meaning that they're more likely to produce um, children and their children are more likely to produce more children, and so on and so forth. Um, and so we could see that each generation, this um, beneficial mutation is going to spread until eventually it may be nearly fixed in the population. So I want to tell you about some of our studies um, focused in African populations in which we're trying to identify genetic signatures of natural selection and regions of the genome that are targets of natural selection. And this is important because it's thought that mutations associated with diseases in modern populations like um, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and asthma may have been selectively advantageous or adaptive in past hunter-gatherer environments. So if we can identify these regions, 
um, that are targets of selection or actual uh, variable sites that are targets of selection, those may be functionally important and may give us a clue about disease risk. So here I'm showing you a few of the populations that we've studied in Africa. And we have people who are living at very different climates, high altitude, low altitude, savanna and uh, tropical environments, for example. We have people who have very different diets, so agriculturalists, hunter-gatherers, or pastoralists. And they have very different infectious disease exposure, so they've likely undergone local adaptation to different environments. And I'm going to, as I mentioned, tell you about two examples today. The first one is the evolution of lactose tolerance in East African pastoralist populations. So the ability to digest the sugar lactose, which is quite common in milk, is due to an enzyme called lactase fluorazine hydrolase, or known as lactase for short. And lactase is expressed specifically in the brush border cells of the small intestine. And in individuals who maintain high levels of this enzyme as adults, they're able to break down the complex sugar lactose into glucose and galactose, which is rapidly taken up into the bloodstream. However, most mammals and most humans shut down lactase activity shortly after weaning. So as adults, they do not have an active form of this enzyme. And what's going to happen is they're not going to be able to break down that complex sugar. It's going to go down into the lower gut. It's going to be attacked by bacteria and you're going to have severe intestinal distress. Now, it has been noted for many years by anthropologists that there's a very strong correlation between the lactose tolerance trait, or you could think of it also as the lactase persistence trait, because there's persistence of the enzyme activity as adults. And they've seen the strong correlation between the prevalence of that trait and with populations who traditionally have um, practiced cattle domestication and dairying. So for example, this trait is most common in Northern Europe. It decreases in frequency as one moves um, into Southern Europe and into the Middle East. It's very uncommon in Eastern Asia and in the Americas. And it's uncommon in Western Africa, which is one of the reasons that we see high levels of lactose intolerance in African Americans, for example. But in regions of Africa where there's um, a high prevalence of cattle domestication, pastoralism, and dairying, we see a high prevalence of this trait. So in 2002, there was an elegant study done by Lena Peltonen's group in Finland in which they identified a genetic mutation that regulates lactose tolerance in Europeans. And it was located near the upstream of the lactase gene. When we sequenced that region in East African pastoralists, they didn't have it. So we knew they must have something else. So in order to identify those mutations, we did something that's called a lactose tolerance test. So basically what we do is we give people um, the sugar lactose in a powdered form. We add water and it basically tastes like orange Kool-Aid. And then we have to line people up and have them drink the lactose at the same time. This is a group of um, Maasai women from Tanzania. Um, this is a group of pastoralists from um, southern Ethiopia. And then we can use a standard diabetes monitoring kit. And what we can do is to measure the blood glucose starting at baseline before they drink the lactose. And then every 20 minutes, we're going to measure this over a period of about an hour. And then we're going to look at the maximum rise in blood glucose. If individuals have a rise that is greater than 1.7 millimolar, we consider them to be lactose tolerant, or to have the lactase persistent trait, shown in light blue. And if they have a rise that is less than 1.1 millimolar, they're considered to be intolerant, shown in dark blue. So we measured this trait in nearly 500 individuals from Tanzania, Kenya, and the Sudan. And then we looked for association 
with genetic variation that we identified by resequencing the region where the European variant had been identified. And doing so, we identified three novel genetic polymorphisms that are associated with the lactose tolerance trait in East Africa. And those are shown here by the boxes. Um, the most common was this one at position 1410, but we also saw two others at position 13915 and 13907 located roughly 14,000 base pairs upstream of the lactase gene, which is located on chromosome 2. Now, one of the really interesting things about this is that, one, these regulatory mutations were pretty far away, about 14,000 base pairs from the gene, and they were located in an intron, in a non-coding region of a neighboring gene called MCM6. So this is demonstrating that functionally important variation can actually be located in non-coding regions. And we were able to, we were able to show, using um, in vitro cell line studies, that these variants um, that are derived, shown in the different colors here, that they regulate expression of the lactase gene um, using the lactase promoter. Now, they're located very close to the mutation associated with um, lactose tolerance in Europeans, located at position 13910, but they arose independently due to a process called convergent evolution, and probably due to a very strong selective force um, to be able to drink, um, to drink uh, milk that contains lactose in these different regions of the world. What's also interesting is that the variants that we identified have a very distinct geographic distribution. So the one that we found that was most common in our study was at position 1410, and we can see that it is pretty localized to East Africa, to Tanzania and Kenya. And that's the most likely site of origin of that mutation. Interestingly, we also see it a bit in South Africa, probably reflecting migration of pastoralists from East Africa into that region. The variant at position 13915 appears to have originated in the Middle East, and we can see that it was introduced into Northeast Africa probably by migration. And then uh, the variant at position 13907 likely arose in Northeast Africa. But again, one of the important take-home points is that we have a functionally important variant that's occurring at high frequency, sometimes as high as 40%, and it's very geographically restricted. And there are likely to be other mutations like that, some of which may have implications for disease susceptibility. Again, emphasizing the importance to look amongst ethnically diverse Africans. So the next thing we wanted to do was to look for a signature of positive selection. And this is the method in which we do, in which we can do that. So imagine here in red, imagine that this is a new mutation that has occurred, say one of the mutations associated with lactose tolerance. And it's adaptive, meaning that it increases the fitness of individuals who have it meaning that they're more likely to have children, and their children are more likely to have children, and so on. And so it's going to increase in frequency in the population. And it's going to drag with it the neighboring variants nearby. So you can see that when it originated, it had, it was on a chromosome with a green variant and a black variant. And now these got dragged along to high frequency through a process known as hitchhiking. Now, if this had gone to fixation, meaning that everybody has it, we would have called it a full selective sweep. In this case, it hasn't quite reached um, a full selective sweep, so we call it a partial sweep. Now, that could just mean that there hasn't been time for it to go to a full sweep, or it could be that for some reason, there may be some negative aspects of having it, and there's a reason that both variants are maintained in the population. Now, after the sweep occurs, you're going to have new mutation events and new recombination events shuffling up the variants that are linked to the mutation that's adaptive. And so um, that will decrease 
the association observed between the mutation and the flanking variation. And in fact, if we have an estimate of the recombination rate, we can use computational methods to estimate how old this mutation is. And that's exactly what we did here. So shown on top um, is an example from the most common mutation that we found associated with lactose tolerance at position 1410. Individuals who have the C variant are able to digest milk. And individuals who are homozygous are shown as red. And what we did is we genotyped um, markers going a distance of about 3 million nucleotides. And what we would do is that if someone is homozygous, starting at the lactose tolerance mutation, and then we go to the next mutation, if they're homozygous, then we continue going. If they underwent a recombination, we stop the line. And what we can basically see is that homozygosity extends about 2 million base pairs on chromosomes that have the lactose tolerance mutation. But if we look at chromosomes that have the ancestral mutation, they have almost no extended haplotype homozygosity. And so this is a classic signature of a selective sweep. It means that this variant was under very strong positive selection, and it rapidly increased in frequency in the population, dragging with it the neighboring variation. Now, here I'm showing the European variant. In this case, the T variant is associated with lactose tolerance, and it shows a very similar pattern. So using computational approaches, we were able to estimate the age of the um, African mutation to be somewhere between about 3,000 to 7,000 years of age. These are the populations that had um, the oldest age estimates, and they include individuals who speak Cushitic languages. They came from um, Ethiopia, and they practice agropastoralism. They came into Kenya and Tanzania within the past 5,000 years. And then we saw it um, very high prevalence and an old age estimate in Nilo-Saharan speaking groups. And these would include, for example, the Maasai. Now, they came into the region more recently from southern Sudan within the past 3,000 years. So if I were to guess, I would think perhaps this mutation arose in the Cushitic speaking populations. But irregardless, it quickly, rapidly spread to all of the populations in the area because it was so selectively um, advantageous and adaptive to have this mutation. Now, because we see the correlation between um, the practice of cattle domestication and pastoralism and the rise of this mutation, this is a really excellent example of gene culture coevolution. And in fact, what's really interesting is that the date estimates that we came up with correlate really well with the archaeological data, which shows that cattle domestication arose in the Middle East or North um, Africa about somewhere between eight to 10,000 years ago. And that corresponds with the age estimate for the European mutation, which we, came, which we inferred to be about 9,000 years old. But cattle domestication was not introduced south of the Saharan, south of the Saharan desert until roughly 5,000 or 5,500 years ago, correlating very well with the age estimate um, for the mutation we found in Eastern Africa. And then it was introduced much more recently into Southern Africa. But one could argue that perhaps Mendelian traits like lactose tolerance, which um, are regulated by a single locus or gene of major effect, are in a sense the low-hanging fruit. They're the easiest to identify. So one thing that my lab is interested in doing is looking at more complex traits. And perhaps one of the most classic complex traits is height. So height is highly heritable. Genome-wide association studies in tens of thousands of Europeans have identified hundreds of loci, each of very small effect, and explaining only a very small proportion of the variation in height. Now, interestingly, most of these are not part of the growth hormone IGF-1 pathway, which we know plays a very important role in um, idiopathic short stature, for example. Now, in Africa, we see some of the broadest distributions um, or ranges in height. 
ranging from the very short-statured pygmies in Central Africa, and then um, we see some of the tallest individuals in the Sudan and in Eastern Africa. And it's thought that these differences may be partly due to adaptation to different environments. So what I want to tell you today is about our genetic studies of um, short stature in pygmy populations from Central Africa. And for you to fully understand and appreciate the work we've done, I think I, I should first tell you a little bit about how we went about collecting these samples and how challenging it could be. So this is um, to, to get to one of the groups that we studied in Cameroon. You have to cross this river, and you have a person who has a ferry. He actually is using um, a hand crank here to get us across. <laughs> and I guess I'm very fortunate because as a woman, I was able to get shade, but not everybody was that lucky. And here are some other hazards that we run into, but I'm smiling because the head is cut off of the snake. But I actually have to give credit to Dr. Alain Fremont, who has been studying the pygmy populations in Cameroon for greater than 30 years, and he did the majority of the sample collection in this case. So the genetic basis of short stature in pygmies is a question that's been of tremendous interest to endocrinologists and human geneticists alike for more than 50 years. The particular populations that we studied are from located in Cameroon, three different groups from Cameroon, whose mean male height is 152 centimeters. And they live in very um, close connection and interaction with neighboring populations who speak Bantu languages and practice agriculture. And their mean male height is 170 centimeters. So that's quite a difference between the two. So the pygmy um, short-statured phenotype in humans has arisen independently in different global populations. Typically, these are populations that live in tropical environments. So there have been a number of hypotheses about why this trait might be adaptive. And these include um, thermoregulation, limited food resources, locomotion, that it may be easier to move in a dense tropical environment if you're short, and more recently, um, there is a, a theory that this is due to a life history trade-off, and I'm going to focus on that theory. And that has to do with the fact that pygmies have a remarkably short lifespan. Their chance of living to age 15 is only about 40%. If they make it to age 15, the expected lifespan is only around 25 years of age. Now, that is due largely to a very high infectious disease burden and a very challenging uh, life in dense tropical forest. Now, what the study showed is that pygmies appear to be reaching um, reproduction, they appear to be reproducing and reaching puberty at a significantly earlier age than other Africans. And the growth trajectory in pygmies appears to be similar to other populations until the point of puberty, and then they lack the adolescent growth spurt. So this may be some sort of a trade-off. There's selection to reproduce earlier because they're dying very young, but that may be a trade-off in that they're not undergoing the adolescent growth spurt. Now, there have been only a handful of physiologic and metabolic studies in pygmies, but nearly all of these are pointing towards disruptions of the growth hormone IGF-1 pathway. So this is in contrast to what we're seeing in European populations. However, there's been quite a bit of dispute of where along this pathway these disruptions are occurring. So in order to try to address these questions, we genotyped um, 1 million single nucleotide polymorphisms in 67 pygmy individuals and 58 of the neighboring Bantu individuals. And here we can see um, a plot similar to what I've shown you before based on structure analysis. And to remind you, this is composed of a series of lines, and each line represents a person. And they can have ancestry from different ancestral populations represented by the different colors. So here in orange um, are individuals who speak the Bantu language and practice agriculture. And in dark green are individuals who self-identify as pygmies. And what you can see is that there's been a lot of admixture between the pygmies and the neighboring Bantu people. Now, interestingly, this tends to be unidirectional, and it tends to be 
gene flow between males from the Bantu population with females of the pygmy population. This is largely due to socioeconomic factors. Now, when we looked at a correlation between ancestry and height, we observed a very strong and significant positive correlation. So we can see that pygmies who have more of the Bantu ancestry tend to be taller. And so this is showing that there's a strong genetic component to this trait. We've also worked with collaborators to develop methods to infer tracts of pygmy and Bantu ancestry across the chromosome. So here, these are the different chromosomes, starting with chromosome 1 and going up to chromosome 22. And here I'm showing you an example from chromosome 3. And in blue is showing tracts of the genome that are pygmy ancestry, and in red are tracts of the genome that are Bantu ancestry. And what we tend to see are very, very short tracts of Bantu ancestry. And that's reflecting the fact that admixture has been occurring over thousands of years. Now, the next question that we wanted to address is how do the genomes of the pygmy hunter-gatherers differ from the genomes of the Bantu agriculturalists and from other groups such as the um, Maasai pastoralists from East Africa? And to do that, we use a number of scans of natural selection across the genome. Uh, without getting into detail about the, the methods, I'll just point out that you can see by the different colors here across the different chromosomes, here's chromosome 22 and going down to chromosome 1, that we found a number of regions of the genome that are targets of selection. But there was one region in particular on chromosome 3 where we saw a cluster of um, targets of natural selection. And this was over about a 15 million base pair region. Now, given our small sample size, we have very little power to detect a genome-wide association. Um, and so what we did is, under the hypothesis that this is an adaptive trait, we just focused on the regions of the genome that are targets of selection, shown here. And then we looked for an association with height. And one of the strongest, most significant associations was exactly in that same 15 million base pair region of chromosome 3. And indeed, it encompassed several genes, one of which is DOC3, which has been shown to be associated with height in non-African populations. So we replicated that finding. But nearby was another gene called SISH, which is a member of the cytokine signaling family plays a very important role in regulating um, IL-2 cytokine signaling pathway. And studies have shown that it's associated with resistance to a number of infectious diseases in Africa. Now, interestingly, SISH also directly inhibits human growth hormone receptor action by blocking the STAT5 phosphorylation pathway. And so we know that studies in mice show that when this gene is overexpressed, the mice are short-statured. Now, this was led me to the hypothesis that could it be that there could actually be selection for immune function that is indirectly resulting in short stature in pygmies, because that gene plays an important role in both. And we need to do uh, further functional studies and look at differences in gene expression to test this hypothesis. The last study I want to tell you about is a study in which we sequenced the entire genomes at high coverage of 15 African hunter-gatherers, including five pygmies, five Hadza, and five Sandawe. We identified over 13 million variants, three million of which are com completely novel. They had never previously been identified. And that's just from 15 individuals. So you can imagine how much variation is out there. Many of these are novel variants. Um, many of these novel variants are in known regulatory sites. So now combining the two um, studies, we wanted to ask the question, which pathways are enriched for genes near targets of selection? And these enriched pathways include genes evolved in neuroendocrine signaling, reproduction, metabolism, and immune function. And interesting, based on the whole genome sequencing study, we saw an enrichment for genes that play a role in pituitary function in pygmies, including follicle-stimulating hormone receptor, growth hormone receptor, HESX1, which I'll tell you more about in a moment, 
and thyrotropin-releasing hormone receptor. In fact, TRHR was one of the biggest um, hits that we saw in terms of these studies of selection. And what's interesting is that this gene plays an important role in the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, influencing a number of traits that could potentially be of adaptive significance in pygmies. And also of interest was that anthropologists have noted that there is a significant difference in the prevalence of goiter among pygmies in neighboring Bantu groups. So the pygmies have a much lower frequency of goiter compared to the neighboring Bantu populations. And this could reflect um, a biological adaptation in pygmies to a low iodine environment. It's very deleterious to um, get goiter because it can also lead to a disease called cretinism, which of course is going to be very deleterious. So again, here's an example where something like adaptation to diet could indirectly influence growth or other phenotypes in the pygmy population. The last thing we wanted to do was to look for regions of the genome using the whole genome sequencing data that are specific to pygmies, and those are shown in green here. Now, we identified 25 clusters in the genome, and the largest cluster was right in that same region of chromosome 3 that we had previously identified. But we had missed it in the prior study. And the reason why is because it contains these pygmy-specific variants that were not captured by the SNP array that we used, and thus demonstrating the great importance of doing resequencing for identifying novel and potentially functionally important variation in ethnically diverse populations. Now, this cluster consisted of 44 SNPs and 100 percent association with each other over 170,000 nucleotides, shown here. And it contained a very interesting candidate gene called HESX1. HESX1 codes for a transcription factor that plays a very important role in uh, regulating the development of the interior pituitary in the brain. And that's the site of production of growth hormone as well as other reproductive hormones. Now, interestingly, we identified a non-synonymous, so an uh, amino acid change, basically, in this gene that had been previously associated with idiopathic short stature in humans. But it turns out that this variant is present at about a 20 percent frequency in other Africans. So what we hypothesize is that there's something about this region that may be altering gene expression of HESX1 or other genes in that region. Upstream, we found another cluster near this gene POU1F1, also known as PIT1 in mouse. And again, this codes for a transcription factor that plays a critical role in regulating growth hormone expression. So another excellent candidate gene. Now, what is interesting is that both of these um, clusters or genes are amongst the most differentiated regions of the pygmy genomes compared to genomes from elsewhere in Africa. So we then picked out some of the SNPs in these regions and genotyped them in a larger set of Western and Eastern pygmies, and we showed that they are statistically uh, associated with short stature in pygmies. So the next step is going to be to try to make transgenic models that um, express these variants using transgenic mouse models and see what the phenotype looks like. So that leads us to a number of hypotheses. One is that alterations in the growth hormone IGF-1 pathway play a role in the short stature trait in pygmies. Two is that anterior pituitary hormones may play a central role in the pygmy phenotype, influencing growth, reproduction, met metabolism, and immunity. And thirdly, that short stature could be a byproduct of selection acting on pleiotropic loci. So if we look here, one of the candidate loci that we identified is HESX1. That's going to influence um, expression and development of the anterior pituitary site of production of growth hormone. Growth hormone expression is also regulated by this other gene we found, POU1F1. And then CISH regulates growth hormone receptor. <clears throat> 
Now, if we look at the downstream effects of growth hormone, um, growth hormone, when it binds to growth hormone receptor, will trigger off expression of IGF-1, predominantly from the liver, but from other tissues as well. IGF-1 will have an effect on muscle growth and also on bone growth and height. But the other impact or the other role of um, growth hormone is that it also influences insulin metabolism. It influences fat metabolism. And then we know that infectious disease alters immune response and cytokine levels, and that these can influence gene expression from CISH or other genes that are in this pathway. So when we go back to Africa to study the pygmies, what we would ultimately like to do next is to measure all of these phenotypes. Because if you want to understand something like the evolution of short stature in pygmies, I think you can't just be looking at stature. Because this is, um, the growth hormone pathway plays a role in all of these different traits. So we need to be looking at this as an integrative picture. And in fact, um, our approach in the future is to use an integrative genomics approach, combining whole genome data, data on protein variation from blood, epigenetic variation, which can be influenced by diet and environment, gene expression. We're starting to look at um, the microbiome, which is um, the spectrum of bacteria in the gut, because that can not only be influenced by diet, it can also have an influence on the metabolome or the set of all the metabolites, for example, in blood. And we want to combine that information together with information on diet and other environmental factors to try to ident identify genetic and environmental factors that play a role in short stature and in other anthropometric, cardiovascular, and metabolic traits. One of the other approaches we can take to distinguish the role of genetics and environment is, for example, to look at individuals of the same um, or similar ethnic background but living in an urban versus a rural environment. We can also take a different, the opposite approach. We can look at individuals who have very different genetic ancestries, um, but live in similar environments. So for example, um, these, this is a girl who is from the Fulani population, and here's a neighboring um, a individual from the Tupori population. So they are genetically very differentiated, but live in a similar environment, yet the Fulani seem to have some innate uh, resistance to malaria infection. By contrast, um, in the, the San from southern Africa are very differentiated from the Bantu, but the San seem to have an innate susceptibility to, D, to TB infection. So again, by contrasting populations with different ancestry and living in different environments, we may identify clues about the genetic basis of differences in phenotypic variation and disease susceptibility. So in conclusion, Africans have the highest levels of genetic diversity within and among populations. The demographic history of Africans and local adaptation to different environments has resulted in population or region-specific genetic variation. And we need to be including ethnically diverse Africans in genomic studies to better identify both unique rare and common variants, which may be of functional importance, including those that play a role in disease risk in these populations. And I will just end by thanking the many individuals who contributed to these studies um, and my funding agencies, and particular thanks to the Africans who have contributed to these studies.